Hey, hello and welcome to episode 64 of the Market Maker podcast. And as per usual, I am joined by Piers Curran, co-founder of Amplify, to tackle some of the major themes of the week. And there's only really one major one, and that is this big sell-off that we've been seeing coming into the tail end of the week, in which we'll dive into and basically deconstruct and explain why is this happening. I think that's fundamentally the, the biggest benefit we can give to, to you as the audience. Um, but before I do that, as promised from last week, I'm going to continue to give a couple of shout outs to get the episodes up and running. And first shout out goes to Daria, who went through the Finance Accelerator. Piers, I'm not sure if you've seen this. Um, she went oh. through the Finance Accelerator and has just been offered the role in the sales and training division at Morgan Stanley for next summer. She said, I quote, while the simulation helped me get noticed by Morgan Stanley, the podcast actually helped me secure the internship position oh yes and uh, she gave quite a lengthy um kind of explanation that they they grilled her for three and a half hours essentially through right. lots of different questions about even elon musk and how right. he's financing twitter down yeah. to what's going on with energy prices and the economic cycle and she said that was a great help. So I'm so pleased to, to know Fantastic. that A, someone's listening and, and B, that it's carrying uh, that kind of value. So but the podcast changing people's lives one, one at a time. <laughs> I love it. Um, and then also uh, Carla and Jolene, they also got accepted onto the MS program for next summer as well. So well done to them. And they came Amazing. through the Finance Accelerator as well. Uh, and then separately, um, just a quick one for Nayan Patel who's been offered a six-month internship at, in Cross Asset UK Solutions at Credit Suisse starting next month. And he was on our summer program last year as well. So, yeah, good stuff coming through okay. the community. Um, and if you're a student at Oxford University, uh, Eddie and I are going to be on campus actually next Wednesday. So, yeah, if so you to are... make sure you're, you're elsewhere. <laughs> so... Um, Look, I mean, I, I definitely part of our mission is to kind of broaden the field. And I know um, perhaps that doesn't fit within that mission. But my, my overall uh, take on this is, look, opportunities are for everyone, you know, regardless of where you, where you sit on the spectrum. And certainly you know, it's going to be a nice change up to, um, yeah, to go on campus at Oxford. I've never been there. I've, I think I've been to, to others like Cambridge, but never to Oxford. So, yeah, Eddie and I are going to be doing a an in-person FA and a Q&A in one of the colleges. So yeah, if you're there, then feel free to get stuck in and, and come and meet us. Um, but otherwise, look, let's get into the main kind of talking point of the week, which was really, I think yesterday was a good summary of where we're at, because in particular, the NASDAQ was down 5%, uh, the biggest single day move down since June 2020. Uh, the S&P down uh, lower than more than 3% at the margin yesterday. Um, big swings, obviously, in the last 48 hours of trading. Yeah. Um, we've seen an 8% kind of price swing in much of the major stock indices in the US. We haven't really seen that since the real depths of uncertainty when the pandemic first hit, when that kind of ferocious move that we saw in March of 2020. Now, the main kind of trigger points here, of course, is the Federal Reserve. Um, they raised interest rates by 0.5%, which was kind of as expected. But the problem is, I think, is the markets were kind of leaning on, well, what if we go 75? And what if he starts to hint towards that in subsequent meetings, which is how the market has been pricing itself to get ever increasingly more aggressive. Uh, and Powell basically came out and, and took that off the table that 75 conversation. Now, I must stress, that's not to say he won't bring it back at some point. It's still an option. Um, but he's taking it off for now. And um, at the time, stocks rallied. I don't know if you saw that on, on the night in itself, Pierce. It was kind of like the buy everything trade. Everything rallied when he came out and he said that, that comment. We, what was your initial thought then? My initial thought then was this is the most ridiculous market reaction <laughs> I have ever seen was my initial thought. Yeah, because really to, to talk about this week, I know obviously uh, yesterday and this morning, it's like, you know, disaster, crisis, it's 
markets have plummeted, it's X, Y, Z, but I think you've actually got to step back to Wednesday evening to properly cover this week. So that's when, yeah, big upside in markets following the announcement from the Fed that they're hiking 50 basis points. I think it's insane what's happened. I, I, I think that what, what's happened is the market has, well, it's, it's sort of, to an extent it's Powell's and the Fed's fault because they have the rate at which they've been getting more hawkish has been quite extraordinary over the last six months, let's say. And I guess markets, they, they always overextend, right? And I don't just mean price. I mean, people involved in markets always overextend their expectations as well. So there's a direction of travel, which is the Fed are getting progressively more hawkish and more hawkish and more hawkish. But you can't, that direction of travel can't be permanent. At some point, they can't get more hawkish. Um, and I think we got to an inflection point on Wednesday uh, and then subsequently Thursday, where market expectations had just got to ridiculous levels on how hawkish the Fed might become. So when they hiked 50 basis points, the markets rallied because it wasn't a 75 basis point hike. And it's like, well, hang on, the Fed of the Fed have never said 70. I think it's one, the super hawk on the FOMC is the only one who's mentioned 75, right? And so markets kind of, it's such a perverse and almost like self-harming market reaction when it's like, oh, relief. It's not 75, let's buy everything. And I think it's the buy, it's the short-term buy the dip brigade who, look, don't get me wrong, have been a very successful brigade in recent years, right? And it's the idea that, well, maybe we should talk about this idea of the Fed put, which is, you might have seen this in a lot of headlines over the last couple of days. And this is the idea where the central bank is propping up stock markets and has done for the last, well, I, I guess ever since the financial crisis, actually you go back more because we actually used to call it the Greenspan put. Uh, <laughs> most people listening to this won't even know who Greenspan is, I, I ex expect, but um, he was the Fed chair back at the turn of the century. And actually it was the Greenspan put. And all that meant was that whenever stock markets go down, don't worry, guys. The central bank have got your back. We will be more accommodative with monetary policy in order to restore confidence and pump markets back up. A put is just a reference to a derivative options contract, which pays out if asset prices drop. Right. So it's like a it's a hedge. It's a protection against the downside. Um, so the buy the dip brigade are always right. If markets have dropped, right, let's buy because the Fed will ride into town and come to our aid and come to our support. And they, their mindset had got so extreme that it's now like the, the idea that the Fed are going to ride in and cover our backs by only hiking 50 basis points. It's like that's how insane it, it's got. Um, and I think that, so markets bounced, right? Big time, 3% up the NASDAQ. When you said the NASDAQ's down 5% on Thursday, it was up 3% right, Thursday, right. on Wednesday night. So let's just kind of get that into context. Um, so net, net, we've got a 2% decline, really. Um, so but when you read the press this morning, they forget about the 3% increase and all it all it is is five percent you know biggest mm. sell-off in however long oh my god it's crisis it's disaster um and look i think it is a crisis by the way <laughs> and we'll perhaps get onto that in a minute but yeah i think it's just insane that rally on wednesday and and it all got given back and more yesterday yeah i was just looking at the the nasdaq 100 future and uh, i know not everyone will have access to charts, but where we peaked on that spike, such a technical level yeah. there on the high that we had just a few days prior on the yeah. 28th and also up and around the highs that we we're seeing on the 26th. It was just like if you had the, the strong conviction behind your thoughts of this is just a, 
function of ill pricing on behalf of markets and the direction of travel is, as you say, rates are tightening, uh, market conditions are going to tighten, then actually that was an opportune moment if you're uh, of a bearish disposition short term to, to, yeah, definitely. Yeah. I'm interested to see how we finish this week, actually, um, because uh, I guess behaviorally what you can see, we've got non-farm payrolls, I should say, coming out this this afternoon. And I should also say, I think <laughs> that's just absolutely um, redundant. I don't think yeah. it, it detracts at all one bit from what's happening right now. Um, but perhaps perhaps a quote here that that I can I can say from the UK equity strategist at Investec, and uh, this chap said that this is really the sum of all our fears. Growth forecasts are being downgraded, inflation expectations are being upgraded, and interest rates are still going up. Yeah, is that the summary of? in the short of what's happening. And I know there's other elements within explaining this with China and with Russia and Ukraine and, and, and other things as well. So here's the thing. That is what's happening. And that, uh, that, that view and concern and expectation, that's not just suddenly materialized yesterday. That's been incredibly obvious for weeks right? That growth is decelerating. We know that. We've had GDP figures that were much worse than expected. We know inflation's going up and we know interest rates are going up. That's a hell of a recipe. That's a, such a bad cocktail of factors for an economy, okay? That is the underlying situation, medium term. Now, you layer on top of that this short-term noise, which is what happened on Wednesday night, where it's you know, it, it, the, the overriding irrational sense of relief that it's not a 75%, sorry, 75 basis point hike kind of, kind of gives you that, that kind of endorphin adrenaline rush and people like, they, they, they forget about the medium term outlook and it's just all about that moment, right? Um, but yeah, it is the worst, it is the sum of all our fears, this is why we've been talking about the fact that we, we are, I mean, almost certainly going to have a recession. And I think when you look at what Powell said on Wednesday night, then, you know, if you're rationally assessing that meeting, then what he said was really bad news. You know, if you could just get over your obsession that, oh, my God, it's not a 75 hike. You know, if you just just put that to one side and calmly review what he said. And really, this is why markets, you know, in the end behaved properly and sold off yesterday. Um, and, and, and what he essentially said is, we're going to hike rates because actually inflation is the big problem. And we're going to hike rates and it's going to cause a recession, but we're going to hike rates anyway. He basically said, we are going to, guys, we're going to cause a recession, heads up. And he's trying to use this terminology, soft landing. So he's talking about how we're going to engineer a soft landing. We need to get inflation under control. That's the priority. We need to hike rates fast to do that. It's going to cause a recession, but that's fine, because actually a mild recession is basically our best case scenario. And he talked, to, and in the meeting, he changed, he changed the soft landing he said it will be incredibly challenging to engineer a soft landing he said it actually and i'm quoting word for word here depends on events that are not under our control and he said that actually it may be so difficult that it might be rather than soft it might be a softish landing um now i know that's doesn't sound particularly dramatic, soft or softish. But there was I was reading a one guy's uh, kind of interpretation on that, which I thought was quite a good analogy. Which was imagine if you're in, in an airplane and you're coming into land, and the pilot gets on the the mic and says, "Guys, look, this is going to be a really difficult landing. You know, I'm not sure it's going to be soft. It might be softish." And you're like, "What? Oh my God, panic ensues, right?" Because then you assume the worst, because it's so, softish is so unquantifiable. Mm. 
basically it means he doesn't really know and he, and he doesn't and i tell you what that is that's concerning so aside from any um as you're explaining that aside from any investors who might be feeling some pain this week the person that i can't help but think when you're explaining this is joe biden because <laughs> it's just yeah. gone from pretty bad to an epic fail surely in the because the timing with this yeah the midterms in november and then the way elon's heading with his freedom of speech brigade yeah and i don't care what trump says about he's not going to come back on twitter even if invited he'll be back (laughs) mark my words in this episode um (laughs) sure the worst worst presidency in in history right but it will go down as that from a technical perspective. If you're looking at actual rating numbers, yeah. it probably will end up being that. He'll be the worst president in history. Yeah. <laughs> Which is a, a sobering uh, and, and realization. Just given, given the, not to open Pandora's box here and deviate too much off, off piste, but just given what I know we're going we're gonna to discuss in a, in a mo- moment about house prices and, and general wealth division and the fact that people's, um, savings and you know the cost of living is going up that's going to create even more social division which makes it even more prime time for a trump type candidate surely yeah yeah i can yeah i couldn't i couldn't agree more um yeah it's the end of this year is gonna it's gonna be a really challenging one and, and the other thing the other thing i just want to mention about specifically about what powell said on wednesday that should cause us a lot of concern um He said that I've got tremendous admiration for a guy called Paul Volcker, who was a predecessor of his. He was the Fed chair back in the 70s, sorry, in the 80s. And that should worry people a lot because what Volcker did was aggressively hiked rates to finally overcome an inflation crisis and in doing so, crashed the economy, forced a recession, and knew he would force a recession. But actually, that was the best case scenario in his mind. So look, this is what's coming. The Fed are going to carry on hiking, even if growth continues to weaken, because the bigger fish to control in the medium to long term is inflation. So that's the reality. Now, obviously, markets have in the end woken up, well, they haven't woken up to that. Look, markets have been trending lower for the whole year, right? We talk about these swings up and down, but look, the the bare facts are the NASDAQ's 23% off its high now, off the high back at the start of the year, okay? So the NASDAQ's 23% down. It's it's made a new low yesterday and actually quite, quite significantly from a kind of technical point of view, took out the March low, which was the low that we had off the, kind of onset of the Ukraine-Russia crisis. So the NASDAQ is right now, it's more than, it's, we haven't seen these levels for more than a year now. And I tell you what, there's not many times you can tell me that the NASDAQ is down at lows that we haven't seen in more than a year. You can't, you can't even, I mean, it was just off the pandemic. It, you couldn't even say that off the COVID pandemic in March 2020, couldn't even make that claim. So this is, a, this is a significant correction, and that's the right term here. So, well, sorry, no, a correction, technically a correction is 10% down. Uh, a bear market is more than 20% down off the recent peak. So we're bear market territory here. And is this the bottom? I, I definitely would say not, in my opinion. Uh, I definitely don't think, um, we're at the bottom here. Um, so look, markets are trending lower. And that's across the piece. I mean, uh, but within that, there are, there are, of course, you know, from an investor's point of view, I mean, like if you're trying to look out ahead, well, and look behind you in the last, let's just take 2022, what's already happened and what's going to happen. And for investors, this is going to be a phenomenally challenging year. I think it's been too easy for too long. Hmm. Um, there was, you know, we often talk about, investors often talk about this thing about a rising tide 
lifts all boats. So like in 2021, everything went up. So actually from an investor's point of view, it didn't matter what you bought, you made money. And that's because there's $11 trillion worth of stimulus that got pumped into the system during COVID. And so everything goes up. You literally can't get it wrong. It's just in 2022, well, pff, everything's going down, actually, <laughs> including bonds, right? It's, it's stocks and bonds have had a shocking year. And I think this is where you, this is where the reality hits home. And, and the, the, I guess you, you sift the wheat from the chaff in terms of proper investors who really know what they're doing. Um, to make money this year is going to be super challenging. Um, and you're going to have to be much more selective. You're going to have to do much more work in terms of your kind of due diligence on these companies, for example. And, you know, it's going to be a bit of a minefield to, to navigate through it. One example before I hand it back to you is, you know, thinking about inflation and how do you deal with that as a company because your input costs go up, right? Your raw material costs are increasing. So, well, how do you deal with that? Well, you pass it on to the consumer. So you price, your prices rise. But some companies can do that much, much more easily than others. Um, so, I, I, you know, examples like if you take companies that have got a kind of rock solid brand and sort of unassailable market shares. So I'm thinking about people like Coca-Cola. They can raise prices, right? And, and they have done. And actually that doesn't have too much of a dent on their on their revenues, um, you know, because they've got such a solid brand. Um, but their Netflix would be a good example of a company that actually has tried to rise, raise prices and it's just spectacularly kind of negatively impacted their, their, their market cap and their share price. So look, yeah, it's going to be super challenging. It's already been a challenging year and it's definitely going to continue to be so. So just, just from a... Um... I, I, obviously, there's no definitive answer here, but just given the the things that we've discussed, the way of which we foresee then the economy developing over the next nine months or so, eight months for the rest of the year, and given the fact then that markets are forward looking, so now we're going through this readjustment episode. Yes, the market overstepped the mark, as you said. Now Powell's kind of switched. He's like. Volker fanboy, this is what we're doing. So we're kind of aware of the fact that tightening is going to happen at, at pace. This is the ramification playing out right now. So in terms of the most, I, I guess I'm just trying to say peak fear. Right. When can we anticipate that? Because then when is it that we've repriced for the peak fear? And I know that the peak, the, the parameters could change. And I guess the one threat I see is still China. And yeah. a very disruptive scenario there takes, you know, us into well double digit inflation in Western Europe and in the US, if that materializes. The disruption impact obviously still exists on the energy front. However, I'd say that's much lower than where we were. But kind of like that peak pricing, if you like, which is the key culprit to weigh down these equity markets. Time wise, do you have any I kind of feelings about that? So it's like the billion dollar question. <laughs> Basically what you're asking is when's the bottom? Um, yeah. <laughs> I'm, you, you know, there's a good saying. I don't know if I should talk about that saying, but um, there was a saying on the trading floor back in the day. But if you try and pick bottoms, <laughs> you, get, you get smelly fingers. Um, anyway, what I, what I would say is, Uncertainty is the killer, right, for market confidence, for market sentiment, for risk, the prices of risk assets. Uncertainty um, is the biggest fear. And, and when you've got clarity on how bad the bad is going to be, then actually that's, that's better. That's a better position to be in than the uncertainty because the human nature is always kind of, if there's uncertainty, you kind of always think about what the worst case scenario, right? And that's fueled by the media. Just have a look at what's going on in the media this morning. I mean, my Lord. Um, so I'd say there's, there's, there's unknowns that's fueling the uncertainty. Powell 
pointed to those in his press conference. Um, you know, de it depends on events that are not under our control. So there he's talking about China for sure. He's talking about, fine, the Russia-Ukraine crisis and for how long will that, you know, sustain this massive spike in commodity pricing? So there's the, of course they're out of his control, right? And so there, there are some massive unknowns. Um, but then I'd say that the other big thing we haven't mentioned yet, which we need to, is quantitative tightening. Um, because it's not just about interest rates here. Um, it's also, it's a double whammy. So this is aggressive tightening. It's not just hiking rates at a pace we've never seen for like 20 years. It's also starting to um, reduce the Fed's balance sheet. It's unwinding all of that stimulus money they pumped into the system um, during COVID. And, and it's the speed at which it's going to be unwound. And I think that was one of the key negative takeaways on Wednesday. Um, it was the speed and then the rate at which they're going to do that. Have you got the stats on that? Um, yeah, if you give me one second, I do. So, Because on their balance sheet, they hold both treasuries and mortgage-backed securities. Um, and so they're going to start to taper, right? And they did this back in 2018 um, and into 2019. But this time around, the, the speed is going to be much faster. So, so the Fed are going to begin allowing its holdings of treasuries and mortgage-backed securities to decline in June at an initial combined monthly pace of $47.5 billion, stepping up over three months to $95 billion. Right. Yeah, I mean, that's... That's so a, that's a run rate. So when we get to 95 billion a month, yeah, that, that's a run rate of more than a trillion dollars per year, right? Um, so here, I, for me, this is the one of the big unknowns. How does that impact the treasury market? Uh, and really the treasury market, you know, you, the US bond market is one of the kind of underpinning markets of the entire global system. I mean, let's, and I'm not exaggerating. So if we find that the Fed's, you know, quite rapid um, unwinding of its balance sheet, if we find that that creates a lot of turmoil in, in the treasury market, then this, that's for me, the biggest unknown here. I think it's quite easy to see that inflation is going to stay high, that the Fed are going to be hawkish, that look, certain, certain stocks are going to get really hurt by that. But what happens in the bond market is my concern, because bond markets have, have rallied for 30 years. And there's a lot of people, there's a lot of really prominent, you know, bond investors that are calling this as this is the end of the 30-year bond, bond rally. And so that means that now yields are rising, right? And like to put it into context, it's quite extraordinary because it's not just the COVID quantitative easing, it's also the financial crisis QE programs, right? And so actually right now, the Fed, they have $5.8 trillion worth of treasuries on their balance sheet, which is actually one quarter of the entire market. Of all of the treasuries out there that the, the US government have issued, the Fed own 25%. And they're about to start selling. And if they're shrinking at 95 billion a month, so yeah, as I said, that's a, that's a trillion a year. And what's happening is yields are climbing. And so one of the big moves this week, yeah, fine, NASDAQ's down 5%, fine. But the biggest moves have been in the bond markets. And you've seen big spikes in yields and you know everything's kind of through the roof. So and that, that, that's been happening this year, though, right? So that's the direction of travel on yields. For example, in January, the two-year Treasury yield was 0.8%. It's now 2.7%. And if we get just a little bit more upside on some of these yields, which I think we're going to have, then we're going to start to see yields we haven't seen for a decade. 
And this is borrowing costs, right? It's the cost of borrowing. And that's, that's tightening. You know, we talk about the Fed changing interest rates, but really what has a more powerful day-to-day -day impact is the cost of borrowing, which is dictated by the treasury market. And if that continues to climb at the rate at which it's climbing, then we're going to really start to see some breaks being put on consumption. And that's where you get your recession. So I, I've, I've quite skillfully... Um, I, was, I was just about to say, you sound like my local MP running in the local elections <laughs> when I ask him about what are you going to do about this? And he gives me the long-winded answer, but doesn't, <laughs> you know, doesn't pick any bottoms. So... Um... <laughs> Well, it's so long-winded that everyone forgot, has forgotten the question by the time you finish. That's, you know, that's I'm like, yeah, yeah, he gets my vote. <laughs> Sounded good. <laughs> not, not yet is the short answer. Okay. All right. Well, look, I, I, I saw this guy on, on LinkedIn uh, yesterday, in fact, yeah. and he popped up on my feed and he said oh, yeah. that the UK is so going to take this bit close to the home. This guy said, UK recession is coming the Bank of England are unable to prevent it. He went on to say the Bank of England only hiked by 0.25%. There will be no quantitative tightening, which we just talked about, until August at the earliest. Inflation will spike to over 10% by Q4, with now a forecasted contraction of 1% GDP contraction in that quarter. What well, are the Bank of England going to do? Nothing. Well, this guy, he sounds like he knows what he's talking about. This guy looks remarkably like you <laughs> on LinkedIn. Yeah. So come on, explain yourself. You said the Bank of England are going to do nothing about it. Yeah. Well, I thought I'd start. Well, firstly, I thought it's a bit unusual for me to kind of be getting involved on the social media side. But I, I've ch I'm changing. So compelled. <laughs> I'm changing my spots. Um, I'm actually going to start to do it more often. Um, yeah. Look, I think. The Bank of England, again, it was one of the most remarkable monetary policy events, I think. Um, I'll talk about the, the Reserve Bank in New Zealand in a minute as well. But look, every central bank's got the same problem, every single one. And it's, that, it's, the, it's the, our worst fears, right? It's, it's growth is slowing, inflation's crazy high. And actually, we've got to a moment in time that we haven't seen since the 80s where... Um, it's the slowing growth that's not the biggest problem. Mm. And therefore, these banks have got to step up and they've got to contain inflation. Yeah, what's so that's what I meant when we're going to have a recession at the end of this year and the central bank's going to do nothing about it. What I mean is they're not going to play, you know, play to the rule book that we've seen of the last decade, which is the, the put, right? It's the central bank put. It's any hint of slowing growth, right, let's stimulate. Let's cut rates, let's cut rates, let's cut rates. Well, sorry, but rates are on the floor. You can't cut rates anymore. All right, let's pump in QE, more QE, more QE, more QE. We've got your back. Um, but unfortunately, they can't do that now either because the bigger, the big elephant in the room is inflation and more QE will just fuel more inflation. So I think we have got to the end of the journey the end of the, the, the highway, the end of the stimulus highway. And um, we've got to turn around. And so there'll be a recession and we will not get monetary stimulus. And that's quite, that's why we're so worried. And that's why the uncertainty is there because, well, how long will inflation remain high? You know, is it by the end of this year actually a slowing economy? does the dampening effect on inflation for us, or worst case scenario, it doesn't, then we've got serious stagflation. And, and that, that's kind of, so yeah, we're, we're in a new era here. And, and it's actually one I've never traded in. And I've been trading for 20 years. So yeah, it's a, the, the, rule, the, rule, the rule book's out. And that's why markets are panicking. Yeah, and talking about the timing, the Bank of England did say, that energy prices could rise a further 40% in October, which we know of because that's the semi-annual cap increase that we'll need to factor in the increase in wholesale prices. So timings-wise, yeah. we've got another 40% to come on the energy price bill. 
I'm sure everyone's felt that when those bills have come in recently, and it's going to get even worse by a quite substantial degree and quite late in the year as well. Yeah, and I think I said that all the central banks have got the same problem. There are subtle differences that each one's got to tackle. And I think for the Bank of England particularly, it's the kind of utility bill crisis. It's the cost of living crisis. Um, and you could say for the ECB as well, and that's perhaps a function that where Europe is, is being more you know, immediately impacted by gas prices rocketing because of the Russia situation. I think for the Fed, they've got us... They're, they're more sheltered from that. You know, they're, they're more immune to the Russia-Ukraine crisis because they're not as dependent on, on Russian energy, right? But the Fed have got a much, I'd say, a much tighter labor market. And then that's kind of their kind of big concern to, tr to try and tackle. Uh, and I said I was going to mention the Reserve Bank in New Zealand, um, which might seem a bit of a random one, but actually history does dictate. They've kind of been a bit of a lead indicator on all of this, they've been a quite a progressive central bank. Um, and they were the ones that first actually came out like that a few decades ago, came out with this idea of inflation targeting uh, as the kind of main policy kind of objective. Um, they've, and they're, 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 they were the first ones to start hiking rates last year. And this week they got massively aggressive with their language and have gone further than the Fed have gone where they're now actually directly and openly talking about asset price bubbles. I mean, this is something the Fed don't talk about, right? They're, they're kind of, it's, the, it's the elephant in the room. They don't talk about asset price bubbles and these bubbles have got to deflate. You know, they, they, they talk about inflation and they talk about having to contain inflation. And, um, but what the Bank of New Zealand said is, look, house, house prices are up 45% in two years. It's a bubble we're going to deflate it. You know, they're straight out and look, we are, and that's something central banks, yeah, that's an unusual one for central banks. They, they, they've always been seen as kind of the silent supporter of asset prices. And obviously that's fed into this whole thing around inequality because the rich get richer as these big asset prices kind of appreciate. And, you know, it's just feeding into that whole more kind of bipolar, more extreme political environment that we see around the world and so on. So yeah, I thought the New Zealand central bank getting way more aggressive and just calling it out that asset price bubbles are here and it's not sustainable. We're going to do something about it. Some context then, what's, what's the house price movements that we've seen over these three regions that you've mentioned? So New Zealand is what you said, 45%. What's it look like in the US and the UK by comparative terms? Yeah, good. Because 45% does sound like a bubble. <laughs> well, yeah, right. So um, in the, uh, so, and again, here, here's where you have subtle differences that these central banks have got to deal with. So yeah, New Zealand, 45%. The US is actually 34%. That's house prices upside in the last two years. So since COVID, right? Since COVID, 34%. The UK is actually 20%. So when we specifically look at the housing market, then fine, there's a bigger bubble in New Zealand. But then if you look at the stock market, well then look at the NASDAQ versus, I don't know, the FTSE 100. Uh, the FTSE 100 basically hasn't moved. Well, in 10 years, never mind two years, whereas the NASDAQ's up, I don't know, what, whatever gazillion percent. Um, so for the US, yeah, it's, you know, it's the stock market that's, that's looking bubbly and it, yeah it's we're beginning the slow deflation okay all right well look to summarize then how would you suggest because i know we do have a bit of a blend of listeners here we've got students who i think we've kind of addressed a lot of the main points of what we set out to do which was why is what's happened this week happened but there are some investors as well and even some of the students who invest what would be your yep. best advice given your 20 years experience at this juncture in time um be very careful <laughs> um i think that there's a mindset that's super dangerous which is uh, i think i mentioned it last week did i it's that kind of relative value mindset where you look at the NASDAQ and you go, oh my God, it's down 25% or 23% or whatever. Right, I'm buying because 
I mean, it hasn't dropped that much in I don't know how long. It's got to be a great buying opportunity. Look, it's, and then you start your eyes get drawn to where it was mm. and you buy because look, it's, it's going to get back to where it was, right? And, and that, that trade has worked for, uh, well, for how long? 13 years. That trade's worked for 13 years since the aftermath of the financial crisis, okay? I don't think that trade's going to work now. I think the, the left-hand side of the chart showing the peak at the end of 2021, I, I think that was an overinflated peak. And so just don't get caught into that trap of buying just because we're down 25% and this thing's got a bounce because it always does. Um, I think you've got to get way more selective if you're trading single stocks specifically, then you've got to be, you've got to be way more selective and, 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 and do some work um, on actually analyzing what these companies do. Um, yeah, that idea of just buy whatever you want, you're going to make money has now, has now gone. I'd also look at things like currencies as well, which we haven't perhaps mentioned, but the, I mean, the dollar's been so strong. Um, it's up 7%. Uh, the dollar index um, this year, and it's and it's a huge move, and we're seeing some amazing kind of levels being taken out. Certainly, uh, I guess the most extreme being like the the, the dollar yen, for example, which I think is now was it a thirty year um, high. The dollar yen, that's the yen weakening, and and the reason for that is it's about central monetary policy divergence. Um, so you've got central banks, you know, who are the most hawkish? Well, the Fed. Who are the least? Well, the Bank of Japan. They're doing nothing. Um, so you, you suddenly get this quite big pronounced divergence, which means it just attracts money into the US, right? So people are buying dollars, which is fueling that upside. It just so happens the dollar is a bit of a safe haven as well in times of crisis like Russia, Ukraine, and so on. So you're getting these big dollar moves. And the, the issue with that is, the further the dollar rallies, the more it becomes a quite a big negative for emerging markets who hold a lot of dollar denominated debt. So these are companies in like places like Turkey, for example, are quite vulnerable where companies have a lot of dollar denominated debt. That means they've got to pay their interest payments in dollars, but they're a company who generate revenue in their domestic currency, the lira, but when the lira is devaluing against the dollar, then in lira terms, their debt mountain is just increasing and increasing. Their debt costs are increasing and increasing, and, 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 it, and it can cause a lot of problems. So, yeah, that dollar strengthening thing um, is also something to keep your eye on. But, um, yeah, be, you know, just be defensive. I, I, I don't think... I, I mean, this is only my personal opinion, and look, I just want to stress, I, I might be wrong, but... Yeah, I don't think we've seen the bottom yet in these broader index sell-offs, but we will. And there will be a moment in time. And I mean, again, you ask that question, when's the bottom? And the answer is, I've got no idea. Um, but I think I will know when we get somewhere around it, just from yeah, so, experience. So I guess um, my, my question then would be, I, I, I get that conclusion. So I guess the next logical question that might offer more interest to the listeners is what are the flags or what are the signs that you would look for to then give you that feeling of, oh, it's becoming a bit more interesting now where we could be reaching that point? It's hard to explain it. Um, it's, it's a feeling. I mean, I guess it's, it's one where you start uh, when you start getting the big bellwether tech firms, actually, um, getting hammered. We talked about Apple a lot last week and how they're a bellwether and a bit of a safe haven even and their dividend policy and their share buyback policy and their huge market presence and brand strength and X, Y, Z, right? If they start getting hammered, like big time, and look, they got hammered like yesterday. They were down like over 5% yesterday. Um, Amazon were down like seven odd percent. Tesla were down eight percent, whatever. But um, yeah, when, when you when you get those big bellwether tech firms into bear market territory, and, and you start getting these big, I think that's kind of when you're coming towards the end. 
because there's not much else to sell. If investors have they've sold all the other riskier stuff and now they're even selling that stuff as well. Right, because by comparative terms, I was looking at Spotify and it was down like 70% from okay. its peak or 80%. <clears throat> yeah. So you hit those real high growth stock names, yeah, those, those high plays, beta, and yeah. then you hit, now you're hitting in the more matured, but still in the same category of stock sector. But yeah, yeah. I, see where, I see where you're heading with that. Yeah, It's the high beta, high risk stuff that gets axed first yeah but then when you got rid of all of that and then you're still kind of bailing out water and you and you start to actually see those big bellwethers getting hammered then it's kind of right well we're probably approaching an end of a, of a kind of normal cycle we, we do every now and then i should caveat get very abnormal you know uh, multi sort of decade cycles and when one of those hits, well, fine. Then, you know, even when those bellwethers start to come off, even that's not the end. But yeah, I, uh, it's too early to call that kind of doomsday scenario. Okay. Well, look, to, to wrap up, just to stress the point, um, legally, both peers and I do not suggest going out picking bottoms. <laughs> <laughs> so just putting that caveat out there. If anyone goes stuff. out there and starts just trying to pick all kinds of bottoms across the marketplace but um yeah thank you peers as ever for um kind of breaking that down um, any questions at all uh, i send out the market maker newsletter daily uh, monday through friday with a weekend edition on saturday i'll drop the link into the kind of description of this video if you're not part of that community then it's a great way if you ever have questions on the back of these podcasts or anything for me and peers you can just reply straight direct to me uh, as I've said many times before, your reply does come to me. So it's not like a team um, that takes care of this. It comes straight to me and I'm more than happy to help. Um, so check out some of the links. As Pierce said, he's also kind of a, uh, alive on social media these days. So I'll drop his LinkedIn profile, both to stay on top of his thoughts of what he thinks just during any big episodes of uh, kind of market volatility or breaking news, but more so as well, just for any student for your network. Um, obviously having been around a while he's got lots of good strong contacts and you know your network is you know not just your direct but your secondary um, contacts and so forth can be super beneficial so with that I wish everyone a fantastic weekend I think it's going to be nice and hot and sunny yeah. so enjoy cheers Piers see ya